hey everyone, this is Chris Keys for Premier Guitar. Today I'm joined by Ariel Posen. Ariel, how are you doing? Great, man. How are you doing? Real good. I'm in Nashville. I assume Ariel's up in Winnipeg. I am in Montreal. But oh, okay. Close enough. Canada. <laughs> up there. But, Two and a uh, half hour flight from there. Yeah. But uh, uh, Ariel, you're probably familiar with all his demos, his videos. Obviously part of Brothers Landreth at one point, but he's forging his own solo career. Uh, and we're talking about that specifically because Headway should be out, you know, I think we're going to air this right before it gets released in March, the first Friday in March. So congratulations ahead of that. Uh, and, Thank you. Uh, man, it's great to talk to you. And we've been wanting to do this for a while. And uh, I guess it took a pandemic for us to, to sync up. But let's just start talking gear. You got the mule. I, I, I got to learn the story behind this guitar. Yeah. So this guitar, I should say right before we kind of jump into this, the landscape of how I use gear right now is so different, like, as you know, because mm. of the fact that we're not playing live. Uh, I'm using a whole lot of different stuff because primarily what I'm doing is writing, recording, producing, doing sessions. So I need a little of everything and I need variety. So I wanted to say that first, but we'll, obviously we'll get into that. Uh, yeah, the Mule... Anyone that's watching this that, ha that has heard me talk about this guitar before will have heard this story, but the long story short is that on my first record, How Long, I there's a song called Get You Back, and I recorded the entire thing live with the band with this Tiesco Del Rey that I bought for 50 bucks at a pawn shop in Indiana on tour five years ago, six years ago now, holy, and it was amazing, like it super microphonic it reacted with the pickups sorry the pickups reacted just with with the speakers in a way that it, i was in the control room and it was it was just doing all this magic stuff and it made for a really cool sonic element on the recording i tried to use it live this is the complete opposite of that it was horrible just very temperamental wouldn't stay in tune wouldn't stop feeding back just unusable well as i say real quick Part of that recipe for that song and that tone you're talking about, and I'm sure it alludes to what you're going to say about this one, is you had like an old K amp, right? That's right. That's right, actually. Yeah, I was. Yeah, we were pushing the shit out of this, out of that K. Yeah. Basically yeah. trying to blow it up. But <laughs> obviously we wouldn't actually try to blow it up, but it was just loud. We wanted that sound of utter destruction. Uh, and when I tried it live, it was just, it just wouldn't do the thing. Understandably so. It's not built for what I do in a live context. So, you know, I had known Matt for a little bit uh, through various people who had like sung his praises for a long time. Oh, I just got one of his mule uh, telly, like mule casters, which is like a telly version. I've been playing his resonator and it's unbelievable. And I've always, I think he was always on the radar, but we always knew each other. And a couple times I asked him, like, hey, man, how would you feel about doing a Strat version of the of the Mule Caster? Because I'm a huge Strat guy. I love tellies. I got one here that I'll show you. But, like, I'm really a Strat guy. That's what that's home for me. How about it? And he's like, I, you know, just where I'm at right now, I don't I don't know if I can put it together in time or do it justice. And eventually he he came around and. I posted a, a clip of something and he just, he wrote me, he said, man, this got me so fired up that I just have to make this strat. Do you still want, do you still want that strat? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sure enough, he did it. Uh, I met up with it on tour. I was in Nashville. I was shooting videos at Carter's with some friends and he shipped it there. So I got to see it and meet it right there. I played it on the gig that night. Took me a while to kind of get to know it, as it does with guitars usually, but this was such a slightly different thing. Now it feels just like another guitar, but mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time with it and really enjoyed it. I could do the thing that I wanted from that Tiesco Del Rey, but it was contained. I could control it. I could, you know, it, it just became a part of me and my sound very much so. So I started transferring a lot of other stuff in my set that I was playing already to that. Primarily because I only travel with two guitars. I'm mm -hmm. typically flying somewhere or we're in the van and we're driving somewhere. We got, I, we don't have, I don't travel in a capacity yet where I have room 
or the help to bring five guitars, six guitars on the road with me. So I bring this because for anything in the standard tuning region, and everyone now, I got to clarify, like a lot of people think that I only play now in B standard, which is this baritone tuning mm -hmm. or open C. Um, the only reason I take a B standard guitar out on the road is because I can go, I have the low frequencies covered if needed, but I could also, you know, capo up and be in that, no I can be in D standard. I can just be in E if I want, um, but it just gives me more real estate below. And same with open C. I don't play a lot necessarily in songs in the key of C. I play a lot in the key of G, uh, F, uh, and some songs in C, but they lend itself well to being open rather than capoing up to like the eighth fret. Taking one guitar in open C allows me to play an open E easily, which I do a lot. It allows me to play an open D easily, which I do, rather than bringing a separate guitar for each of those. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I would bring one of each tuning for a guitar and like maybe just a couple songs a night would be on an open C. Probably just a handful would be on this guitar. But for live it works. And uh, in studio it's a very different thing, which is my capacity of music life right now. Um, but it, this guitar has become such a integral part of my sound and I've gotten to know it. This is actually the second one. I was gonna ask because I, I thought I pictured you in my mind of memories what I have left is uh, like a cream colored one almost kind of like Jason Isbell's uh, that Tom Stadler built him he yeah the original one is actually pink it's oh, a real okay. subtle pink but in pictures it looks cream for yeah. sure now was that one that you got like how did that go and fall in line with the one that you're holding right now well what happened was I I, uh, I got the the original one I, I think it was September 2018 that's on the tour that's when the tour that I was on was. And I was playing that for, you know, it just, I was touring heavily. I released the record at that time. And then I realized there was a couple little minor kinks that we could have tightened up along the way, um, which we had just ended up fixing on the original one. Just because like we, he, he wasn't used to like the wiring inside in this capacity it's different than the telly style there were just some things that this it was the first one so we had to figure some things out along the way mm -hmm. but i had been using the guitar so much and it was becoming such an important part of my sound i couldn't really i felt like i couldn't do a gig without it so i wanted a backup i wanted a spare just to be safe mm -hmm. so he built me a backup and that showed up around april so you know seven months ish later and at that point it showed up and I was like, okay, I guess I'll, t I'll take this one. I was touring the States and I guess I'll take this one out on the road and something about it. I connected with this one with so much more mm -hmm. and I, I almost, it's like the first one is the backup now. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about pickup differences? And is there anything that different between the first one and this one, and, and anything else that's warranted between like the two thing, the two models? Pickups are the same. Uh, string gauge is the same. Bridge saddles all the same. The only difference, and I don't know why that is. Uh, I mean, the neck, the wood, I think is is I have like some kind of darker baked. I don't even know what it is. I think it's just like a baked maple on both probably, but it's like cosmetically, that's the big difference on them. Okay. I, essentially everything is, is the same. I feel like my the original one has a bit more headroom. Like I play it and it, it, it really doesn't compress at all, which I like. Mm -hmm. This one actually compresses a bit more for some reason. Still has that headroom too, but it just if I had to compare one, like it's the exact same pickups. We tried to match the pickup height is exactly as close as possible to where they were. Uh -huh. um, but but something about this one is just slightly more low output, which I really like. What are the pickups in that? Because I know like with your Mockingbird from Josh Williams, you have Ron Ellis pickups. Is that the same or does uh, I'm not familiar as with Mule? No, does he make his own? These are pickups? Mule. I think he calls them Tom Buckers. Okay. And he he they he makes them himself, and they're mint. They they look like 
they're supposed to look like gold foils, but like if you look closely, I mean, it's. I don't know if you can see that. They're mm. they look like mini humbuckers, and and that's what they are. They're okay. just mini humbuckers. And did you have any, uh, I guess, not requirements, but any guidelines to what you wanted the pickups to sound like, or is it kind of something that he already uses and you just put them in? That's exactly right. It was it was based on what he already uses. Uh, because the mule caster, like the telly, is the exact same pickup configuration. So I said, you know what? Let's start with what works already. I've I've tried one, and he, he tried a couple with actual humbuckers. I think he tried some throwback pickups in a in a couple models, which are killer pickups, and I have them in other guitars. He said it didn't quite connect for him as much. Some there's some magic about like the lower output pickups. I would be curious to do another one with, you know, some like do a single coil strat setup or something like that and see how it reacts. You briefly mentioned uh, strings. Uh, could you be more specific in terms of like brands and gauges? Yeah, so again, this is only when like the other guitars I'll show you are, we'll get to those, but I can't stress enough. This is another thing that everyone thinks I'm only always playing these these gauges, but it's only when I, I'm tuned down to B or C, I'm, I've been using string joy out of Nashville mm -hmm. and we came up with a a combination of 17 to 64 with a wound third string that really just does the trick and how I always say it should feel is like it shouldn't feel different like yeah you feel a bit of just a touch of fight because it's heavy you know it's heavy strings but if the setup is right if you're in B, it should feel like you're in standard tuning. Like, don't get me wrong, playing 13s in standard tuning, that's insane compared to this. It's a whole different thing. The tension is matched, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's what works for, I basically run down like the same cycle. So like for standard tuning, depending on the guitar, I'll play 11s or 12s standard. Like that's my, that's what I like. I dig in and I just like a bit of a fight. I don't like it to be too light and loose. Mm -hmm. If I was going to go to D, open D, you know, I'd probably do 13s or 14s. Go to C, probably 15, 16. And then we got to B, 17. It just worked out that way. So it's just kind of like wa walking down the ladder to match the tension that it would normally feel like in a, on a normal guitar for me. That's the mindset behind it. Now, what about you know, this thing gets... it's. A question that not often asked in these because it's so, I guess, like ingrained in the player. It's individualistic, but it's worth asking you because you go from fretting, you know, chords and slide at the same time. How is your setup? Do you go with high action or higher than I guess most people would assume? Yeah, this is this is the thing that's the same on any of my guitars. I don't know the exact measurement. Yeah. But yeah. my tech just knows and I have to, and still even my tech that has been setting my guitars up for me forever, I still need to take it, play it and go, ah, uh, almost a bit higher or ah, uh, too low. It's all feel based. It mm -hmm. needs to be high enough that I can play slide comfortably. So definitely higher than average, but not like absurd high, but it has to, and it has to be low enough that I can play without a slide because I really do 50 50 50 percent of the time i'm playing with a slide 50 percent i'm not so it has to be a balance of both and it's possible to find it you just can't wait too. it just can't be too low and it can't be too high there's this sweet spot right in the middle and it diff the reason i don't have a specific measurement and i've asked and they're just like eh, it's always kind of changing depending on the guitar of course mm -hmm. right so it's all based on feel but there is this sweet spot that just takes a little bit more work and time to find it but when we do it's like ah we got it. Now, as, as I'm eager to move on and, and get introduced to some other instruments, but let, let's fool around with this one a little bit more and kind of hear what it has to say. And what do you like tonally that it does for you in both like uh, a standard plane and plane slide? Yeah, this this guitar, I mean, right now I have it clean. I'm going through a, a Two Rock Classic Reverb, by the way, which is like my main recording amp here. And when I play live, I always play a Two Rock as well. Uh, but for recording, I use that 90% of the time. I also have a Rev D20 that you can't see over here, but I can take a picture of it. Also just a fantastic option. Sometimes I'll record the two rock into the aux, 
which is what you're hearing right now. Mm -hmm just for daytime volume sake, uh, I'll run that through the aux and the rev has like the two notes thing torpedo built in. So I can actually run both amps at the same time. And since the rev doesn't have a reverb that I would use, I think one of the cabinets has a like a digital reverb. I usually just run it dry and together they, they actually play together really nicely. But for now you're just hearing the two rock. So yeah, just clean it's, oh, let me tune that up. Now, I've seen you play, whether it's, you know, on stage or it, 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 I'm sure if you're able to bring your own amp is uh, a traditional clean from Two Rock. Is that more for like live settings and, and the classic reverbs, like you said, for recording? Honestly, no. It's oftentimes if I'm doing fly out dates, I'm so grateful that the guys at Two Rock are just so fantastic and like will break their back to make sure I can have an amp wherever I am. So any Two Rock... They all have different characteristics, but they all work for me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I do. Re I think the traditional clean might be my favorite because it's the most simple of all the amps. And I'll never forget when I first went to the uh, the shop in Rohnert Park, California. They said we're working on this special amp. You're like one of the first ones to try it. Didn't even have a, a case yet. It was just a chassis. And I expected to really fall in love with the classic reverb. Plug into the classic reverb. Sorry, I plug into the traditional clean first and immediately it was like, oh yeah, it just sounds absolutely incredible. There was nothing to change. You know, I like stuff where you plug in and immediately it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I plugged in the classic reverb and just due to the nature that there's the dip switches and there's like the fat gain and all this other stuff, it's awesome. But it was just a bit more complex to get that same sound. Mm -hmm. Then I got it at the end, but I liked the traditional clean, which is like, boom, here it is. But I've done gigs where I've shown up and it's a TS1 or a Bloomfield or a, even the studio signature, which is like the 30 watt version. And they all do the trick for me. All those amps have just such musical headroom and dynamics. And since I'm t often traveling with these guitars that are tuned lower, again, due to the sake of me not having the luxury of bringing multiple guitars on the road with me, I need an amp that can hold those lower tunings and still put and like I just like to feel the air moving I want to fully feel that uh that air mm. and dynamics and headroom and that's what those amps give me so oh, right. whichever one shows up on stage I'm just grateful that it's there I'm never like oh it's a bloom field instead of a uh, classic re like they're all fantastic to me yeah no bum outs yeah all right well let's go back to the guitar uh, kind of divergent there so let's talk Let's hear what this guitar has to say. Okay, sounds like this. Just clean, neck pickup. I should also say I typically have one overdrive on always. And I really ride my volume pedal. So I'm going to turn on... I know we'll get into the pedal board, but this is my signature AP broadcast, broadcast AP. So this is full open. It's not that dirty right now. I typically have the volume there around like six or seven. I just love it because it sounds the keyword is different. It's not necessarily smooth, like it doesn't you don't get like that glassy strat thing, you don't get that bitey telly thing. It's not the warm 335 Les Paul thing. It's just kind of its own sonic space. Mm -hmm. And it's just different. <laughs> 
Different is the key word, and that's what I like about it. Well, you, you put it on, I think it's perfect time to talk about it, is your signature rock slide. And, you know, I, I'm curious why you ended up with brass, because there's so many materials out there, glass, beer bottles, yeah. uh, whiskey flasks. Why, why brass and why that works for you? And also, I find unique uh, on your design is the ball tip ending and why you go with that, you know, because most of them are open or, you know, some are open-ended. Sure. Well, I've known Danny for... Danny's the guy that runs the rock slide. I've known him for, we're coming up on 10 years now. I believe it was like 2012 when we first met. Um, we've always had a great relationship. And like w whenever touring with the Brothers Landreth, we'd always stay at his house in Spokane, Spokane when <laughs> we'd be playing Seattle or Vancouver or Portland. We'd always just like, make a point to stop there. And... First of all, I started playing slide. I had no idea which slide I should play. I, I always played slides that were way too big. I had a brass. I had a glass, nickel, ceramic. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, I love this guitar player named Kevin Bright. He's one of my favorites. He always played a brass. And I just loved... I just loved so much of what he does. I was like, maybe brass is the vibe, you know? So once I started using rock slide stuff, I would try a bunch of brass ones. And I just kind of found like a comfort with brass. It's a bit brighter, in fact. I like warm everything, but like, I think glass and like ceramic slides are way warmer than brass. But for what I do and like the way I EQ things, it, it does seem to work really nicely. So what happened was one of the times we were on tour, we stayed at Danny's and we went to his basement. And at the time, it was just like this huge... You open the door and like the light is just so bright of because there's all these slides like shining at you. <laughs> and he told me, he's like, hey, man, I'm trying this new, these new ones out. Do you want to take a stab at it? It's like the one you already play, like a slightly medium sized brass slide with these tip ball tips on it. I was like, okay. And I, and I tried it out and the ball tip doesn't necessarily help you do anything. Mm. Like it's, it's, I'm never actually digging in with the ball tip what it does is let's say i'm playing on the bottom like the fifth string normally with if it's a cut edge you could get a little bit of like this ugly noise mm. scraping it just kind of takes any scraping possibilities away and softens the edge if you're ever playing close to the edge so long story short, I played this, I tried it out, I played it all night and I, like, I actually really took a liking to it. And then a few months later, you know, we, we decided to do signature slides, uh, both for myself and for Joey. And I was like, he suggested it and I was like, yeah, why, we should really do that ball tip thing. Like, first of all, it's different and it feels really good. I just, I wanted a size between small and medium. That was kind of the sweet spot. Slightly smaller interior. And it, yeah, it took a couple rounds. And then I don't use anything else. I have this. This is the exact same slide. This is my slide with the dome, the ball tip cut off. We, we were just messing around with some things for fun. And even though it's the exact same slide, it's really a different. I, it made me realize how much the length of just having your finger up in there. I know that sounds kind of funny to say, but <laughs> it really makes a difference. So yeah, that's that's the that's the backstory behind it. Um, yeah. Well, should we move on to another guitar? Sure, man. So again, I, I can't stress enough that like these days, I am uh, recording so much. So it's just about variety. And uh, you already mentioned this guitar. Oh, yeah. This is my Josh Williams. Yeah, so Josh is a good friend of mine, great guitar builder. And uh, I have this Gibson 335 that I've had f for almost a decade. This, If you look at any like early uh, Bros Lives videos, like you'll probably see me playing this guitar. I've always loved it. Uh, still have it, but you know, it just, I just always struggled keeping it in tune. It was just some, had some temperamental issues with it. And basically, 
I wanted to kind of replicate that guitar because I love how it looked and I love what Josh does and you know I love what Ron Ellis does he's a good friend and it's an honor to know him and get to have some of his pickups in my guitars and and that's this guitar this is one that I often will take out on the road with me because again it's in C so I keep a capo on it so songs in you know D I do that and suddenly hey look I'm I'm an open D now Oof. Sorry, just 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 clean. Yeah, it's a beautiful open dynamic. It's just so it's just very dynamic. The pickups like are they're high, they're like PAF style, but they're still like I don't know, there's something about them that I still live around seven or eight, you know, especially like, let's, let's say a kick on a fuzz. This is fully wide open. And I just turn it down slightly. I know the fuzz kind of cleans up on its own, but I'll show you. I meant to show you just with with an overdrive how it cleans up. Like, sorry, that may have peaked. Did that peak? I don't. And not on my end. I don't know. It sounds marvelous, but you know, I can't can't say. Just to be safe. So yeah, wide open. Turn it down a bit. I'm just not a person that likes to tap on, tap off pedals for, for gain stages. It's all on the volume knob. Every guitar is volume knob. Do you ever go to full 10? Yeah, yeah. Like when there when there's a moment to like rage and like go full <laughs> eclipse, that's when. But it, it's it's very sparingly. Like that's the whole point. Yeah. So um, that's Josh Williams. And then I'm going to grab this guitar. These are my two main, first of all, these guitars, the three guitars you've just heard are like all over Headway, like probably the most used guitars on the record. But these two guitars are my like open tune guitars. I just keep them both in C. So and like if you were to tour, would you, you kind of mentioned the, the first um, mule that we looked at was the main one. And then the second one would be the Josh Williams or would it be this one? It would be my Josh Williams or I have a Collings 360 LTM, which is not with me at the moment. That's that's my typical open tuned touring guitar. That's kind of okay. like a Les Paul meets Jazzmaster. Yep. It's great. But this Jazzmaster, first of all, again, I've always been a Strat guy, but this guitar has changed my outlook on Fender guitars. Like this Jazzmaster, I've always loved Fender guitars, um, but the Jazzmaster might be one of the most insane guitars out there. And uh, I don't like treble bleed, so I, I made sure that there was no treble bleed. So actually, when you turn the volume down, it actually gets warmer, which I really like. I know some people might not like that. Yeah, this guitar.
Now, what was the impetus for you to kind of go down the jazz master road, being a Fender guy? Is it was it something to use your word different than what you have in the arsenal, or was it a moment or someone introducing it to you or saying, "Hey, man, you really should check out a jazz master." It's uh, it was self motivated and self discovered. Uh, I was on tour in the UK and I was at Regent Guitars and I saw a guitar that looked exactly like this and I played it and it was beautiful. It just changed, it changed the landscape of how I, okay, I love a Strat, I love a Tele, they sound, they have their thing, but it was just different. It, it occupied a different sonic space. So different was the keyword. And again, this is in a lower tuning. So I know there, it's a bit of a different beast in standard, but with the big open piano chords. Rhythm circuit here. It's just, it's just occupied a different sonic space that I hadn't experienced before. And it was just inspired, inspiring. Like that's what inspires me is difference, new things, new sounds. And especially when you're cutting tracks on a record, a really bright, open, E, jangly thing on this and a real dark, open, jangly thing on the, on the Mockingbird together in stereo makes a pretty nice thing. You always want to have two real opposite regions of sound at least for me so you call you call it heaven at least in terms of like dark or not dark but heavy and light are you saying that because you saw my video of me breaking down a song where i went this <laughs> yes. and this is heaven yeah yeah <laughs> i might have watched it yeah <laughs> my man that's well, exactly it though um and those are uh yeah these are like the only two open open tuning guitars that i have that i've been using like primarily right now do you want to see a few more yes absolutely that's what we're here to do ariel okay so again I, I i haven't gigged with any of these guitars and i don't know that i i would for my thing but again for recording you need some sp specific tools and this is uh the fender ultra telly which came out last year and i was part of the campaign i did a bunch of videos i did some mods to this guitar i had my friend chris moffett who has his own guitar company called Kithara Guitars out of Northern Ireland, which is a shout out. Check them out. It's great. He made me a new tort guard for this. Oh, it's beautiful. And I actually also put Ron Ellis pickups in this. And it's got 12s. I believe they're Ernie Ball 12s. Standard tuning. Sorry, got some verb on there. You know, it's a telly. But again, it's important that for recording with all the dark guitars I have, it's so important to me to have the bright, you know, just to balance those sonic regions. I can't stress enough. How many times have I said sonic regions so far? I feel like I've said it a million <laughs> times. We'll put up a counter. But again, the, the pickups that came in this guitar sound really great. Uh, way louder. These are way lower output, vintage style. It's I believe it's his 50 style tele pickup. I don't know the actual name, but... They seem to work really well in this guitar and, and they get along. So can, for sessions, it's really uh, fantastic. Can you recall where maybe in Headway this made a, you know, a, a, an appearance? This guitar, the, the, the next three guitars, actually the rest of the guitars you're about to see aren't on Headway. Okay. But just the, sure. the Jazz Master, uh, okay, I'll just like the Mule Caster is from songs you've heard already. It was all over uh, Coming Back, Carry Me Home, 
what are we doing here? And uh, the, the Josh Williams is on Now I See, which is a song that comes out tomorrow. But we'll, I guess we'll be out already by the time this airs. Uh-huh. And and a bunch of other songs on the record that aren't singles. And the Jazz Master, any jangly open stuff you hear, songs like I'm Gone, uh, Big Picture, Sometimes You Lie, uh, Now I See as well, It's You, though it's all over it. It was just such an inspiring tool. Um, and now I'm in a process of just, I'm just writing more and, and producing and writing for other people. So, so much... Most of the sessions I do these days are like, which I'm grateful for, is like they're calling me to do Ariel Posen on their song. So a big part of that are, are these those guitars that I associate my sound with. But I still mm-hmm. have my sound on tools that I'm not using as regularly on my records, at least at this point, because some of these instruments are still new to me and I'm trying them out and figuring them out, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you got to kind of figure out what where it allows you to still speak in your tone and yeah. more you than it is the instrument yeah so this is a cool guitar uh i met patch the guy that makes these guitars through matt from mule and i've been trying this guy out have you seen these wide sky guitars oh wow it's beautiful so gorgeous guitar made out of new mexico um i'm not really a les paul guy like i'm way more of a 335 guy but this guitar occupies that space where a Les Paul could kind of cover that ground. It's just got, it, these are Curtis Novak. This is actually a P90. Looks like a, a humbucker, but it's a P90. And this is a like a PAF. rock machine I was gonna say it's a rock machine I literally was about to say that a yeah. rock machine it can be pretty but it's a beautiful guitar and like for for that rocky thing big chords and like leads it's a beautiful guitar for that beautiful guitar okay one more electric okay let's let's do it this is the wackiest one so i had no experience with this before but it's kind of been a game changer on some sessions and i apologize in advance because it's, it's literally the hardest thing to play for me just simply because i haven't really put the time in but this is a fretless Oh. Um, and, you know, if you're like me, you you only really associate fretless with bass. Yes. Jacko and... Or, like, if you listen to Screaming Headless Torsos, David Fusinski. He's, like, the only fretless guitar player I know. Anyways, I know of. So this thing, it's just, it's just wild, man. Like, check this out. <laughs> Sorry for the attitude playing. I'm <laughs> what's like your bet? What's like your initial takeaway of something like that? Because it is a total. I mean, it's a it's a familiar instrument, but it's a completely different instrument at the same time. Yeah, so I like, mean, what, what I just enjoy did, about it. What I just did there is not what I would use it for. I would actually use it as textures with chordal mm. things. So, I find like two note chords work the best just f- at least for keeping intonation just like you know if mm-hmm. 
you know? Yeah, like I did a tune the other day where it was just like those kind of chords and I was just, you know, you put some extra like reverb and stuff and it was just... It's very different from slide than what you would think. Like everyone asks if it's like playing slide, but in my opinion, it's super different. It's a completely different thing. It's just like all the things you were used to doing. Yeah, you just can't do all your normal stuff. I should also say this is made by Dahlberg Brothers in Copenhagen. Huh. In Denmark. Um, they, yeah, they had reached out. Again, it's about different. And I, I was like, you know what? This could be a really useful tool to have a fretless. Like, it's, it makes for, it's one of those sounds that when you're listening to it in the concept of, context of a recording, you shouldn't be able to pinpoint what it is. You're like, what the heck mm. is that? And that's, that's what I'm going for with something like this. Just... I just love it. <laughs> it kind of like... It, it, I know there's no context because you're just playing alone through the amp, but it's like... It could be a disguise like pedal steel. It, it, it could definitely morph into things like you're saying that you can't pinpoint uh, to the ear. 100%. Okay, here's this guitar. This is, this is a cool one. This has been maybe my most recorded instrument since the summer. Now, have you been on a gear splurge? Because I know, uh, you know, there's articles we see as 2020 closed that uh, guitar sales and guitar related products sales have been spiking i've definitely bought a few things i don't know if it's like a uh, i've had a spike but there's been a handful of stuff uh-huh um yeah i don't know a mixture of both yeah i don't think nearly as much as other people but a good amount of stuff i've i've got my i've been fortunate to get my hands on this was uh let me just tune this up here so this guitar it's a, it's a it's an old 50s k like an old, it's kind of a piece of junk, but this guy Ruben at Old Style Guitar Shop in LA takes guitars like this and he makes them these beautiful instruments. And yeah, throws a pickup in there. Like this is a Hot Rails. <laughs> throws some flat wounds on it and uh, it becomes this absolutely beautiful character instrument where you put a mic on it and you plug it into an amp, and I'm just gonna move my microphone down so you could hear it, but this is what it sounds like. Super inspiring, for me at least. I, I get a lot of mileage out of this guitar for writing and for recording. Again, it's about a texture in the, in the context of a mix. When you have a, an acoustic going or a bunch of electrics, something like this is different and pops out in a different way. Now, it, it, I can't, I, I think it's Baxendale, but I could be wrong, but I know that the drive-by truckers and uh, Butch Walker have guitars by a different guy, I think he's out of Alabama, that does a similar type of process. He finds old acoustics and rebuilds them to, you know, modern playability. Ah, yeah, I mean, I met Ruben through some friends of mine in LA who are all amazing guitar players also, and I had always seen them playing guitars like that, and something about it just always, that sound was just like, oh, that's such a nice, gorgeous sound, I'd love, it's another tool in the toolbox, right? Yeah. So 
they yeah were kind enough to introduce me to him and uh yeah had had it, it, and this is just what he had made like you never know those kind of things it's like well this is just what i currently have it's not like i have a whole stock of stuff it's whatever falls on the bench and i'll turn that into something and he happened to have this and i was like yes <laughs> i'll take it yeah well should we have you put on an electric and then you know you already briefly mentioned the amps yeah. Uh, if there's anything else you want to talk about those amps, otherwise uh, we can move right into your pedal board. Yeah, I was going to talk about one more acoustic, but we don't know. Okay, to... yeah. No, we can totally do that. So I have a nice Martin D28 at home back in Winnipeg, which I don't have here at the moment. Um, but the fine folks at Callings have let me try this guitar out for a little bit. But I've just been using it a lot on sessions. And this is their D1A T, I believe. Can you hear that? Yeah, oh yeah. And it's just, it just does the thing. I've always loved Dreadnoughts more than like OMs or like Jumbos or any other stuff. I've just, it's just my favorite kind of guitar. And for recording, it just... like much more traditional sounding than the 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 k that we just heard which is good 100%, for like recording 100 percent. like the uh the k is a character piece for once you have all the meat and potatoes down that serves as something to just put up put on top of it you know it's the gravy <laughs> it's the gravy exactly okay pedal board uh what guitar just i guess i can just dealer's choice okay we'll go there back go. to the mule so yeah this board has been i'm actually in the process and maybe we'll have to do like an episode two down the road but i'm, I'm in the process of putting together a a new studio board uh, like w with some pedals that I wouldn't necessarily hit the road with. Like I have the Automaton and the the Poly Digit on there, and the other the the Maris Chase Bliss one. Okay. The, you know, a lot of crazy awesome pedals. A lot of MIDI that would be way better in a studio setting. The the pedal board I have here, I've had I've been using this for a year. It served me well, very well on tour before everything shut down. And you know what, for sessions, it's actually fantastic too, because I have the Eventide H9, the Tonal Recall and the Dark World alone just have so many sounds to it. Those are powerhouses. Powerhouses. All three of those. So yeah, I mean, I'll just go through it in reverse order, I guess. Lead us, lead us down the path. Okay, so I'm just clean right now. The only thing you hear is the Tonal Recall. And it's got like a slap. I need to clarify another thing. I did a little rundown somewhere else and I said, yeah, I use the tonal recall only for a slap. And what I meant was when I'm playing live, I'm just not as much of a delay guy. So I always have slap on. Uh, for recording though, it's a different story. So <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. wanted to make that clear. <laughs> Beautiful delay. Delay, you know, it can it can literally do a million things. You know what's up. Um, yeah. A big sound I use a lot is tremolo. So on this board, I have the Victoria. No, I'm sorry. At home or. Yeah, I'm a mess today. Apparently, I have a Victoria <laughs> Reverberato, which is harmonic trem and reverb, which I use on every record I do. So headway, how long? Anytime you hear tremolo or reverb. 
Actually, not necessarily for reverb because the two rock has such great reverb, but tremolo is always that unit. Mm -hmm. Here, I've been using the Walrus Monument, which is great. You add a little bit of reverb now there's already reverb you're hearing from the amp but i i like to use the dark world for the plate setting again it can do a lot of shit <laughs> it can do so much yeah. but the plate sounds so good I could just get lost in that endlessly. I really like that. Now, I have a question about like you use such specific gear in the studio, and you're not going to take that with you. Like you mentioned already, "Get You Back" is a song that you use kind of specific gear that you would never tour with, or you tried, didn't work, and now you get that. And then the other question for a song that's coming off the new album: What are we doing here? Uh, that I'm wondering if that has that vibrato because I hear some movement, or is that like a Leslie pedal? And how are you going about recreating things that you're using such studio-specific gear? And I'm sure you're going to play those songs live. So how do you do that without breaking Okay, that so that's, I'm going to skip ahead then. So what are we doing here, for example? What I did was a lot of these, basically all the same pedals were used. I had like the, the Jesse Davey King Tone Fuzz, which is this guy. with slap on which is very important i had no reverb on which i will get rid of and then i i turned on the h9 i have this like auto filter sound which sounds like this and then i turn my volume down just a touch So like what what you were you what you're used to hearing That's that sound. And I use that filter sound quite a bit on this new record. Yeah, Carry Me Home is another song where I hear that vocal, very vo voice-like sound. Yeah, exactly. So same Eventide H9 filter sound with, the bro with my broadcast and the plate, which we used a real plate when we recorded it at the studio, but this does the trick perfectly. That's definitely the sound. There's one other song on the record, which as we film this hasn't come out yet, but I've been performing this song for a year and a half, like before the pandemic hit called Heart by Heart. And it's got this kind of sound on it. I, I don't know. I, I found that, that sound very pleasing to my ears during the recording of this and writing of this record. And I just stuck with it on a lot of songs. It was just it was subtle, yet different. Again, different is the key word. And I've had a couple people ask, is that like a harmonic tremolo? Is that um, like a mod filter? Sorry, not a mod. Uh, um, what is it? A ring mod? I was like, mm. no, it's it's just a more of a concoction of things, you know? Now, didn't you write a bunch of this, if not the whole thing, shortly after the f last record, how long, wrapped? Like you hit, and so you're kind of 
this is almost old material to you in a way? Some of it is, yeah. So uh, recorded how long? In March of 2018. Probably signed off on all the masters by June, July 2018. And right then and there, I started writing new stuff. So we recorded Headway December 2019. So I had about a year and a half of writing these songs and starting to perform a lot of them live. Okay. Which was good to be able to like test test drive a bunch of them and get to know them in that kind of regard. So do you have like a third album already in you then, I assume? <laughs> I do have some songs, which I'm, it took me a while in this like pandemic. I, I can speak for a lot of my friends and myself, of course, like it took me a long time to feel motivated to be creative. Mm. Uh, but finally it hit me and I have been writing a lot lately, which has felt really good. And I am starting to think, all right, I know this second record isn't out yet, but I'm already thinking, what's next? A lot, yeah. lot more music in me, I think. <laughs> well, awesome. Let's get back to the regularly scheduled broadcast and get back to your pedal board. I kind of yeah, yeah. threw us so, on a sidebar there. Yeah. Uh, so H9 has a bunch of sounds. Like if you want to hear a couple other common sounds that are on my immediate use is this Leslie. <laughs> Which sounds really nice if you kick the fuzz on too. So I like that a lot. The H9 also, these are sounds I wouldn't use as much live, but for studio, which is again was what I'm doing, I have this nice little like tape delay sound. I have this room sound, it just sounds like it's room mic'd instead of close mic'd. And then just some other bonus ones like another slap just in case <laughs> the the old crystals classic h9 crystals or the seagulls i think maybe they're called a little other delay like this hall reverb And that's about it. Oftentimes I'll be doing a specific session and you know, the best thing about the H9 is you kick on your, your computer or your iPhone. I just pull up the app on my phone and I have so many more sounds at my disposal. These are, those are just like the easy access ones ready to go. Yeah. But often when I'm, I'm, I'm in the thick of it, I'll have a phone just with other sounds just in case. Cause like, you never know if you're recording for someone and they go, I would love a reverse delay with this quadra univ who like they'll create something that doesn't exist. And then I look uh -huh. it up on the H9 and it's like, oh, it does exist. It's there. Yeah. So it's yeah, good for that. Their, their engineers are out of this world with what they create. Agreed. They're insane. Now, I got to ask while we go through the pedal board is like, is there anything on your pedal board specific that compensates? Because a lot of times you hear slide players talk about uh, sustain. And, and, and that kind of, and, and like you said earlier, maybe compression or not having compression. Are there things in your board that compensate for that or no? No, I don't, I don't use compression. I, the last thing I want to do is compress my sound and I want to control all the dynamics. So I get sustained from a well set up guitar. When it's set up correctly, it's going to sustain. I get sustained from a loud amp with a lot of headroom. Yeah. Pushing it with an overdrive the whole time and using my volume as my master on the guitar rather than using different pedals. I never have a shortage of sustain for slide. Have you ever messed with a foot volume pedal or you prefer it right in your hands? I used to do the foot volume pedal all the time back in the day. And it was great. It's great for swells and stuff like that. But I found it sucks a lot of tone out. And it's kind of a distraction. I I like doing swells. 
I think the pot on my my volume pot might be a little dirty right now, but I just like doing it myself. But... I'm just so used to doing it by hand now that I it, it's, it would serve too much as a distraction mm. with a volume pedal. Okay, so I've, I've shown you the broadcast, that that's what you've been hearing this whole time. I have a Jan Ray on here, which it's got a bit more gain the way I have it set right now. We all know the Jan Ray, it's a great, just overdrive. Usually live, that's my always on. Okay. And then I'll use the broadcast to push the Jan Ray. So I'll, without it, kick the broadcast on gives it a little extra mojo and then the the mini fuzz by king tone is next the what are we doing here sound is just the fuzz on its own but live specifically i i almost always put it on top of the January. so okay. it just gives it a bit more meat like <laughs> way over the top and it's fun you use it sparingly in the right moment and uh it's great i'm often using it like in this kind of context like more up high stuff you know well i in, in, one of my favorite tracks of seeing you or hearing you play is angeline that live track you did the live version of it and that's like such a dynamic range that you bring to the table with the slide playing you do it kind of starts off real soft chris isaac with the bends and real real motive and by the end of it i wanted to get to the end of this question it was like what is going on at the end of that song where yeah hell's breaking loose and speakers are about to explode that is it right there what i just showed you it's okay it's kicking the on that fuzz. fuzz and i'll actually live i will kick on the dark world too which gives it that plate sound. I find live, the reason I use slap all the time and not delay, I like to make, a lot of people use delay, I think, to make their sound bigger and last longer. And I like to get that from a reverb instead. I don't necessarily want to hear repeats. I just want to hear, rather than hearing the note, no, no, no. I'd rather just hear the note. I just rather hear sustain than repeat repetition. Uh. And that's what um, the dark world does for me. So like in that Angeline moment, I'll, I'll typically have the Jan Ray with the tonal recall on. That's it. Until And like my volume's like on three for the first couple minutes. And then I always talk about this. We level up to the next tier and I maybe go to seven or eight on the guitar. And then when it gets to that point where it's balls to the wall, I kick on the fuzz, go full volume, kick on the reverb too. And it's just... It's just a big, it's a big sound. Um, the last pedal, man, is is the Mythos Argonaut, which is the tiny version. No, there's no uh, EQ or anything. Is what you get is what you get. Octave. Here's what it sounds like without the Jan Ray. Sorry. have the January on so with the January it sounds like this it's such a lead sound that like I personally don't have a lot of use for it other than to elevate a lead moment mm -hmm. it's tough to find rhythmic sounds it is like pretty poly like you can get some chords out of it but it's meant for screaming blasting leads you know <laughs> Man, there's always a time and place for that. That's that's for sure. Now, Ariel, thank you so much for hanging out and talk to us about your gear. 
Uh, this will air, hopefully we'll get this out if all goes well, knocking on wood here, is uh, March 3rd. So your album Headway comes out March 5th. People want to check that out and everything else you're doing online. Where's a good spot to go on? Yeah, uh, well, my website, Ariel Posen's great. Links to everywhere. If you want to buy an album, physical or digital, uh, courses, music, videos. I mean, Instagram, at R I'm at Ariel Posen everywhere. So come cool. uh, join the party. Awesome, man. Well, thank you again for making this, uh, this opportunity for us to hang and talk gear. Really appreciate it, and congrats on the new record. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. This is... It's an honor to do one of these, so thank you so much. We'll do a real one once you're uh, in Nashville next time, for sure. Deal. Deal. All right, man. Everyone out there, Ariel, you stay safe. Keep rocking.